May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. Thirty-nine years now. <laughs> <laughs> Been working seven days of the week, three hundred and sixty-five days, over sixteen to eighteen hours a day. Here I am. People say we have touched over a billion people today, but a billion is not the world. World has become nearly eight billion now. So I'm just telling you my sob story. I will die <laughs> a failure, <laughs> but a blissful failure. <laughs> <laughs> I... I don't think that you will be dying of failure, if it's any consolation. <laughs> so, my podcast is called 4D with Demi Lovato. <laughs> no, don't say 4D and all, because there's a whole bunch of idiots back in the India who have some problem with the word dimension. They think I use it too many times. What they don't understand is that in my life, I constantly live multiple dimensions within myself. So now that you are also 4D, just for them so that because they always feed on this one word and, you know, say ugly, nasty things about me so that they are also happy, I will say it 4D means dimension, 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 <laughs> so that all the idiots are happy. Yes! <laughs> I guess I don't need to explain to you what 4D means. Any fool who thinks that what I do not know cannot exist is a bloody fool, mm -hmm. okay? So you might not have experienced the fourth dimension, but you know there is something beyond what you know that's very important. Yes, exactly. So that's 4D. Yes, and... and... okay, you said it perfect. I'm saying for all those people who might not have experienced anything beyond what they see, what they hear, what they smell, what they taste and touch, essentially sense organs, do not ever think that what you do not know cannot exist. That is the crown of ignorance. Ignorance is there, ignorance is not bad as long as you know you're ignorant. Yes. When I know that I do not know, I am... my intelligence is constantly seeking. You cannot help it. It's not a choice, I am going to become a seeker. There's no such thing. If you realize you do not know, everything within you will start seeking. So, you will destroy your seeking the moment you think, what I do not know cannot exist in this world. So, it's good. If you are in fourth dimension, if you are in three dimensions, you must talk about the fourth dimension. If you are in fourth dimension, you must talk about the five... fifth dimension. When I say talk about, you are not talking about something that you do not know. At least you are addressing there is something more than what I know. And that's very important. That is an acknowledgement of the limitations of what I know, so that always there is a seeking that your seeking never sleep, your intelligence never sleeps, your body may sleep because it needs sleep, but your intelligence, your consciousness, your seeking need not sleep. Eight hours a day seeking is not going to work. You need twenty-four hours all your life, you're seeking, otherwise your life will become very small. Most people are not even in three dimensions, they become just one. Their thought and their emotion is everything. Yes. <laughs> what do you say to people who... who want to help shift those people out of their first dimension views? Right now, uh, I've... Uh, you know, like, this is not... Uh, I don't know how to name it because whichever way you say it, people will think it's one kind of description. We have launched what is called as Conscious Planet. I'm seeing how people who have influence in the world can own it and take it on, because the idea is just this. One, there is something about human consciousness. Another, there is an ecological situation which needs urgent attention. All this talk about meditation, consciousness, spirituality, seeking, all this is only meaningful if 
we make sure there is life on this planet for the next few centuries or millennia. Right now, that's in serious threat. In the last fifty years, more than sixty percent of the vertebrate po population is gone. Eighty percent of the biomass insects are gone in the last thirty years. They're saying by twenty, twenty, you know, this twenty-first uh, century ends, they're expecting more than fifty percent of insect species will be gone. This means there is a serious threat to life. When I say serious threat to life, see, there is substantial evidence to show that if all the worms disappear right now, life on this planet, including you and me, will end in not more than eighteen months. If all the insects disappear, life on this planet will end in four and a half to six years. If all the microbes disappear, it will end right now, right now. But if all of us disappear, human beings, <laughs> land will flourish, life will flourish on this planet. So this unnecessary level of significance that we have attached to ourselves and our existence needs to go down a little bit. Our love for life needs to go beyond our species. This is very, very important. This is yoga. Yoga means union, that you experience everything as a part of yourself. If this experience doesn't happen to more and more people, especially if this experience doesn't happen to people who hold responsible positions in the world, we as a generation will be opening up a threshold of destruction, which is very difficult to turn back. I am deeply involved in this, I have been in touch with various scientists, uh, United Nations organizations. Everywhere it's very clear that if we do something significant to turn this back in the next fifteen to twenty years, things will turn around in forty to sixty years' time. But if you let it go these twenty years, go business as usual, then if you try to turn it back, it may take two hundred years to turn it back. So right now, either we correct this consciously or nature will correct it in a very cruel way. Lot of people already, already environmentalists, not virologists, environmentalists have started talking and saying the present pandemic also is one of the outcomes of this environmental disaster that we are unleashing upon ourselves. So conscious planet is… because as I see, there's really no problem on this planet. There is only one problem, the human being. There is no other problem. If you fix you and me, yes. it's a done thing. But to make everybody willing, as I said, last thirty-nine years, I thought, who would refuse to be ecstatic? Who would not want to be blissful? But people are so deeply invested in their miseries. <laughs> How much ever you do, they hang on to their miseries. This is because still life is compulsive. It's not become conscious. A human being, so we don't call, refer to any other creature as a being, only to this one, because this is supposed to know how to be. If you know how to be, what is the problem? There's absolutely no problem with this. Mm. Well, I think that I have to end it there because that was actually my favorite thing that I heard you say. And I want all of you, people like you, young people who have influence over the next generation, to take up this conscious planet. This is not my organization, mm -hmm. this is not my business. I think this is the business of this generation, to create conscious human beings and in turn create a conscious planet so that we will leave something that we are proud of for the next generation. Otherwise, we are uh, leaving it like a disaster. We are leaving the world like it's been ravaged by war. We call this business. Mm, business, yes. Uh, do you have any last words of wisdom for my audience? I'm going to live for some more time. Why do you want me to tell the last words right now? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, you have a very good point. <laughs> Never mind, we'll have you back another time. My beard may be gray, but I'm… I'm living for some more time, Jenny. Yes, you are, yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Ananda Tirta.
out of his own device and deception. He devised it in such a way that he will always be in Gautama's physical presence. Gautama warned him, this is not good to fix up life like this. You are fixing me up like a wife would fix her husband. Because Ananda Tirtha, being Gautama's elder brother, before he took his monkhood, he put a condition on Gautama. He said, right now I am your elder brother. I can command you to do whatever I want. But once I become your disciple, I will have no such power. So let me exercise this right. And now I am telling you, after I become your monk and your disciple, never should you send me away from your physical presence. I must always be in your physical presence. Never you should say, go there, do that, do this. Always you must keep me next to you. Gautama said, you are trying to fix me up like a wife. Never you should love anybody, never you should do this. This is not good for you. This is not at all in the interest of your well-being. But as an elder brother, you are asking me and if you insist, I will abide by this. But I am telling you, this is not good for you. Ananda said, it doesn't matter, but I must be in your physical presence. He stretched it to ridiculous lengths. This wanting to be in the physical presence of Gautama, he stretched it to ridiculous lengths. It came to a point where after eight years break, Gautama went back to see his wife, who was his wife at least, Yashodara. Yashodara is a very proud woman. Gautama, being her husband at that time, and Yashodara with an infant child, Gautama left the house without telling her in the middle of the night like a thief. He did that because he admitted that he did not have the courage to face her. If he looked her in the eye, his determination to go in search of truth may falter. If he looks at his, at his child, when the child is awake and calls him father, his longing to know may falter. So he left in the night. Now he is going back after eight years, a fully enlightened being. But he is sensitive enough to appreciate the emotions of Yashoda, how she would have felt and how she is still angry with what happened to her life. What happened to Gautama's life is fantastic. What happened to Yashodara is not a good thing. He knows that. So he is going there to see what he can offer to her now to compensate for what she has lost in his eight years. So it is a sensitive situation. So he told Ananda, this once relieve me from the promise that I made you. This is not for myself. For me, she is no more my wife, I have grown beyond those things. But for her, I am still her husband who deserted her without telling her, without giving a warning about it. So this is a sensitive emotion for her. She is a proud woman, it is not good for you to be there. Ananda said, you must keep your promise. Gautama bowed down and said, okay. And he took her, took him there also into that situation. When Yeshodara saw that he has come with an assistant monk to face her, she just flew into your age. 
Gautama knew this. He said, this once, relieve me of this promise that I made. This is nothing spiritual that you are going to miss anything. This is about my wife. But he said, no. Then, towards the end of Gautama's life, Gautama's work created many enlightened beings. But Ananda was still the same man. One service he has done for Aziz, he recorded everything, events that happened according to his understanding. But he recorded everything very diligently. So, people asked, why is he still like this? So many people just came and met you for a moment and they got enlightened. They have transformed themselves in so many ways. But he is always sitting next to you and why is he like this? Gautama just said, a spoon cannot taste the soup. What you refer to as the guru is just a certain energy, a certain possibility. It's not the person. So the physical presence, is it important? It is very important. But the physical need not mean the physical body. The grace is not an airy thing. We can make it very physical. It's as physical as the breeze that you feel. It's as physical as the sunlight. Initially, when a person is just beginning to become receptive, being in the physical presence of the guru becomes very essential because your way of perception is only seeing and hearing and five senses. Because of this, you want to hold him in your eye, you want to hold him in your ears. This is the way you know he's there. Yes, it is a necessity in the beginning, but you need not remain there all the time. He will be very physical. Even without doing any activity, you can still manifest what you want. If you organize these four dimensions, in one direction and keep it unwavering in that direction for a certain period of time. Right now the problem with your mind is, every moment it is changing its direction. It is like you want to travel somewhere and every two steps if you keep changing your direction, the question of you reaching the destination is very remote unless it happens by chance. So, organizing our minds and in turn organizing the whole system and these four basic dimensions of who you are right now in one direction, if you do this, you are a Kalpavruksha yourself, anything that you wish will happen. But right now, if you look at your lives, everything that you have wished for till now, if it happens, you have finished. <laughs> everything and everybody that you have desired for, if all of that lands up in your house today, could you live with that? Once we're empowered like this, it's very important that our physical action, emotional action, mental action and energy actions are controlled and properly directed. If it is not so, we become destructive, self-destructive. Right now, that is our problem. The technology which is supposed to make our life beautiful and easy has become the source of all the problem that we are destroying the very basis of our life which is the planet. So what should have been a boon, we are making a curse out of it. What has brought incredible levels of comfort and convenience to us in the last hundred years or so, has also become a threat to our life simply because we are not conscious action, we are in a compulsive state of action. So organizing our minds fundamentally means moving from a compulsive state of activity to a conscious state of activity. You might have heard of people for whom they asked for something and beyond all expectations it came true to the, true for them. Generally this happens to people who are in faith. Now, 
Let's say you want to build a house. If you start thinking, oh, I want to build a house, to build a house I need fifty lakhs, but I have only fifty rupees in my pocket, not possible, not possible, not possible. The moment you say not possible, you're also saying I don't want it. So on one level, you're creating a desire that you want something, on another level, you're saying I don't want it. So in this conflict, it may not happen. Someone who has some faith in a god or in a temple or whatever, who is have simple-minded, faith works only for those people who are simple-minded. Thinking people, people who are too much thinking, for them it never works. A childlike person who has a simple faith in his god or his temple or whatever, he goes to the temple and says, Shiva, I want a house, I don't know how, you must make it for me. Now in his mind, there are no negative thoughts. Will it happen? Will it not happen? Is it possible? Is it not possible? These things are completely removed by this simple act of faith. Now he believes Shiva will do it for him and it will happen. So is Shiva going to come and build your house? No, I want you to understand, God will not lift his little finger for you. What you refer to as God is the source of creation. As a creator, he has done a phenomenal job, there's no question about it. Could you think of a better creation than this? Is it in anybody's imagination to think anything better than what is there right now? So as a creator, he has done his job wonderfully well, but if you want life to happen the way you want it, because right now, the very crux of your happiness and your well-being is this, if at all if you're unhappy, the only and only reason why you're unhappy is, life is not happening the way you think it should happen. That's all it is. So if life is not happening the way you think it is... it should happen, you're unhappy. If life happens the way you think it should happen, you're happy. It's as simple as that. So if life has to happen the way you think it should happen, first of all, how you think, with how much focus you think, how much stability is there in your thought and how much reverberance is there in the thought process will determine whether your thought will become a reality or is it just an empty thought. Or how, how you do not create any impediments for your thought by creating negative thought process. This possible, is something possible or not possible, is destroying humanity. What is possible and not possible is not your business, it's nature's business. Your business is just to strive for what you want. Right now you're sitting here, if I ask you two simple questions, I want you to just look at this and answer this. Right now from where you're sitting, can you just fly off? You say no. Right now from where you're sitting, can you get up and walk? You'll say yes. What is the basis of this? Why you say no to flying and yes to walking? Because past experience of life, many times you've gotten up and walked, never did you fly off. Or in other words, you're using the past experience of life as a basis for deciding whether something is possible or not possible. Or in other words, you have decided that what has not happened till now cannot happen in your life in future. This is a disgrace to humanity and the human spirit. What has not happened till now on this planet can happen tomorrow. Human beings are capable of making it happen tomorrow. So what is possible and what is not possible is not your business. That is nature's business, nature will decide that. You just see what is it that you really want and strive for that. And if your thought is created in a powerful way, without any negativity, without any negative thoughts, bringing down the intensity of the thought process. The first and foremost thing is, you must be clear what is it that you really want. If you do not know what you want, the question of creating it doesn't arise. If you look at what you really want, what every human being wants is, he wants to live joyfully, he wants to live peacefully, in terms of its relationships, he wants it to be loving and affectionate. Or in other words, all that any human being is seeking for is pleasantness within himself, 
pleasantness around him. This pleasantness, if it happens in our body, we call this health and pleasure. If it happens in our mind, we call this peace and joy. If it happens in our emotion, we call this love and compassion. If it happens in our energy, we call this blissfulness and ecstasy. This is all that a human being is looking for. Whether he is going to his office to work, he wants to make money, build a career, build a family, he sits in the bar, sits in the temple, he is still looking for the same thing, pleasantness within, pleasantness around. If this is what we want to create, I think it's time we addressed it directly and commit ourselves to creating it. So you want to create yourself. In the United States of America, there is a segment of people who believe that next time when Jesus comes, he will come in United States. Generally, it's believed he will come in Mount Olive in Jerusalem, but now US people are saying, why will he go to Israel? That's not a good place to go. He will come in United States. So they asked me a question like this in a large gathering, Sadhguru, what do you think? Jesus will come in United States or in Jerusalem? I said, see, last time he came in Jerusalem and he said, come follow me. Only twelve people, hmm? Today you are celebrating him as a great being, but only twelve people followed him. In that one of them freaked on him, all right? But if he comes to United States today, if he says, come follow me, you have a bank loan, student loan, car loan, house loan, holiday home loan, you are mortgage for forty-five years. <laughs> if Jesus says, come follow me, nobody will be there because everybody has to go to the bank. So you have entangled yourself in such a way, even if the most significant things happen, you can't change the direction of your life. Hello? If the greatest things came your way, you cannot change the direction of your life. This is a slave's life, isn't it? What is slavery? He cannot choose. That is slavery, isn't it? Now, you are making that kind of arrangements in your life, you cannot choose, you're stuck in your own arrangements. A spider whips a web for other things to be caught. But if you are that kind of a spider, you build a web in which you are caught, you are a stupid spider, isn't it? And most human beings are in that condition. <laughs> if something significant happens here, you are going this way, if something really significant happened this way, you can go this way. Your arrangements will not trap you. This is an intelligent life. If you are smart enough, you will make arrangements that support you, not arrangements that entangle you, isn't it? One who is next to you right now is your neighbor. Another cosmos. Well, that's really easy. If you have to just one love, one being, it costs life. Neighbor does not mean somebody who lives next door. Whoever is… whatever is right next to you right now, one who is next to you right now is your neighbor. If Jesus had said, love somebody who is in the other side of the planet, they would have loved them. Moving easy. Your neighbor, he is not good. Isn't it? This moment, whoever is next to you, if you learn to love him, you will become loving by your own nature, isn't it? Yes? Because this moment this person is there, another moment another person is there, next moment an insect is there, next moment somebody is there. If you just learn to love anything that is next to you right now, your nature will become loving. Loving means what? On the level of the emotion, a certain level of inclusiveness, isn't it? Love your neighbor is not easy, it needs transformation, isn't it? Something about you has to change to love your neighbor. To love God, you don't have to change anything. You can bullshit yourself completely. You can bullshit the whole world and still love God.
This is just like these days it's become a fad everywhere, especially I find the new age spirituality in the West has taken on this. Oh, I love humanity. I love the cosmos. Well, that's really easy. You don't have to love anybody. If you have to love one individual, well, it costs life. If you have to just one love one being, it costs life, isn't it? I love the whole cosmos, but I can't stand the person who is sitting next to me right now. That's a different thing. Now this is just bullshit, too much of it. Yes? I love the whole humanity. Where did you see the whole damn humanity to love them? No, I just love. Yes, that's very easy. Just try to love one person and see what it costs. So much of you, you have to put it on the ground. So much of you, you have to surrender. If you have to love just one person, isn't it? Yes? But I love the whole humanity. This is easy. Someone said, love the Neva. That's very significant, very significant. Oh, let me check who is my neighbor. <laughs> That's not the point. Whoever is next to you right now, whatever is in touch with you right now, just to love it indiscriminately. The very air that you breathe, neighbor? Yes? Is it your neighbor? the water that you drink. Neighbor, sitting here, right? Hmm? Is he your neighbor? Yes. The land that you walk on, is he your neighbor? Yes. Just to know that, whatever is in touch with you right now. Now, this is something else, it costs life, otherwise it won't happen. What is life? This is after sixty. You should have asked this question when you were eight, <laughs> at least when you're sixteen, <laughs> sixty. But what to do, better late than never, <laughs> he asked. Then yogi <coughs> laughed and went into raptures. Oh, life… life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. The bishop looked at him and said, what? Life is like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? Our teacher told us, life is like a thorn. Once it gets into you, if it… if you sit, it hurts, if you stand, it hurts, if you lie down, it hurts. What is this fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? Spring breeze? So the yogi smiled and said, well, that's his life <laughs> So this comes from the fundamental that when a human being clearly, experientially understands that entire experience of human life is created from within, never from outside. Right now as you sit here, do you at least see me? Even if you're not listening to me, I'm saying. <laughs> Can you use your hand and show where I am? Ah, no, no, you're getting it all wrong. You know, I'm a mystic from South India <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. Where do you see me right now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself, where have you seen the entire world? Within yourself, have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Right now, someone next to you, if they touch you, you think you're experiencing their hand. No, you're only experiencing the sensations in your hand. 
in the very nature of things, you cannot experience anything outside of yourself. When everything, when the entire experience of life is caused from within you, at least it must happen the way you want it, isn't it? Hmm? The world will not happen the way you want it. At least <laughs> the experience of living here within you must happen the way you want it. If… if… if your experience of life happened just the way you want it, how would you keep yourself, blissful or miserable? Please, you must tell me I'm going to bless you. <laughs> blissful or miserable? Blissful. For yourself, definitely highest level of pleasantness for yourself. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, <laughs> but you know what you want for yourself, isn't it? Now, blissfulness or pleasantness of life is not a goal by itself. It is only when you're blissful by your own nature. That means you determine the nature of your experience. No matter what is the situation, you determine the nature of your experience. Or in other words, you have no fear of suffering. Only and only when there is no fear of suffering will you walk full stride in this life. Otherwise, it's always about what will happen to me, what will happen to me. Every step is a half a step. Now, this so-called spirit of Eastern wisdom comes from those beings who walked full stride, who determined the nature of their experience. The outside never decided who they are. So, they could walk full stride and explore the depths and dimensions of life that others never dare to touch because most of the humanity is only concerned about what will happen to me. What will happen to me means what? Will I suffer? That's a question. The first and foremost thing, if you truly want to explore dimensions which we are referring to as another dimension of wisdom or knowing, is that first you must determine the nature of your experience. You have no fear of suffering. Only then, truly exploring human consciousness becomes a reality, touching dimensions of intelligence which gives access to the entire universe becomes a possibility. I'm supposed to open up for questions. <laughs> it's time you ask your questions, please. The population I work with that are in the verge of homelessness or they're addicts, if I tell them that it is your intellect and it's your perception and this doesn't exist, they will laugh at me because it definitely they exists. Must, because yeah. it's the dumbest thing to say. Right. So I wanted to know the spirituality that you teach, the spirituality that many gurus teach, how is it usable for someone that doesn't have food to eat and it's going to become homeless and there's so many problems, especially in America. I mean, how do... Of course, I teach them resiliency, it's a different fact, but to, every time I want to open my mouth and use some of your teachings, I have to set back. Now, the first uh, problem is uh, that you believe in the teachings because this is the problem with the entire world. They've been cultured in some belief or the other. This is what is significant about what is referred to as Sanatana Dharma or what is referred to as the Indian way of looking at things is, this is not a land of belief systems, this is a land of seekers. Never ever were anybody encouraged to believe anything. If you see anything that comes from that land, you will see it is all about questions, <laughs> never about a belief system. If you enter an Indian home, in the same house, five different people are worshipping twenty-five different gods and goddesses. <laughs> they still not made up their minds, which is… <laughs> Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful but not a good man. If you don't let that man rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. That part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it. Whatever 
we are referring to as Jesus is not about some man two thousand years ago, it's about a certain possibility within every human being. So that has to rise. It's not that there is no Jesus in you, it's just you kept him hung, impotent. He needs little empowerment, he needs to be raised. So the whole effort is that part of you which we can call Jesus or Shiva or whatever you like, to allow that to rise. Can you say Shiva is a good man? No, but he's fantastic. Even Jesus, not a good man, wonderful, not a good man. Anybody who disturbs the existing situation is not a good man, isn't it? Yes or no? In any given situation, someone who disturbs your family situation, somebody who disturbs your social situation or political situation, national or international situation, is not a good man in that society, isn't it so? So Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful but not a good man. Shiva, definitely not a good man, but fantastic he is. If you don't let, let that man rise within you, if you do not let that aspect rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. Dead is good, dead is always good. Yes or no? Once it happened, a five-year-old boy and his mother went to the cemetery. He had never seen a cemetery in his life, this is the first time. The mother was dedicated to one particular grave, she sat down. The boy went about everywhere, reading all the inscriptions on the tombstones. He went through the whole cemetery, read everything and came back to his mother and asked his mother, Mom, where do they bury all the horrible people? Every tombstone says this was the most wonderful man. Dead is always good, isn't it? Dead is good, living is trouble. Because living is trouble, we reduce the living to half dead. Fifty percent life is safe. That's where most people have settled. We must decide, dead or alive. Half dead is not good, isn't it? Once Shankaran Pillai was arrested for mixing horse meat in chicken cutlets and selling. So when he went uh, to the court, there was nothing else to do, so he pleaded guilty. And they asked, how much horse meat and chicken meat, how did you do? He said, fifty-fifty I did. So he got some fine and some kind of thing and then he came out. His friend asked him, what did you mean by saying fifty-fifty? He said, the one horse, one chicken <laughs> That's fifty-fifty <laughs> So, this mixture won't work. You have to raise the dead. You really have to raise the dead that part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it. And they have no problem, they'll never fight about it <laughs> because it's a land of seeking. So, first mistake you make is you believe what I say. I am constantly reminding you, don't believe a goddamn thing that anybody says, but don't be foolish enough to disbelieve it either. All you have to do is Experiment with it, does it work or doesn't work? If it works, you keep it, otherwise rubbish it, what's the problem? Now, about somebody being hungry, somebody being homeless, somebody being in a war zone, all kinds of horrible things are happening on the planet. I am not ignorant of it, anyway you said living in a temple, I am not living in a temple, I am more of the world than you are every day. <laughs> I want you to understand, I am running a volunteer organization with over four thousand full-time volunteers and over three million
part-time volunteers doing variety of work, huge projects, over a dozen businesses and the spiritual movement, okay? Now, I want you to understand, more things are going wrong with my life on a daily basis than anybody's <laughs> life. Now, when a man is hungry, if you try to tell him, your intellect is the source of your problem, <laughs> it's obscene. It's obscene, it's nothing short of that. I never spoke to hungry people and said, your intellect is the source of the problem. I'm talking to people who are bulging <laughs> in so many ways. In their head and in their body, they're bulging. I'm only talking to that segment of the population. Those who are not fe fed well, I'm doing social projects with them, with nourishment, education, health, all for free. Will I ever go and talk to a starved man in an Indian village and tell him, your intellect is the basis of all your problems? <laughs> what makes you think that I'm that stupid? <laughs> do I look like that? <laughs> so you also don't do that. This is for you. You need to understand this, there are million problems on the planet. All these million problems are essentially because those who are reasonably well have never cared to reach out and do what needs to be done in the world. In many ways, they're making sure those people don't get it. <laughs> yes, in the year 2012, we have produced enough food for 18.2 billion people. We had only 6.6 .6 billion people in that year. But still, fifty percent of the population is malnourished and hardly eaten anything. This is not because there is no food, because this is because you and me have not cared, isn't it? So, is it true? Is it true? Nobody stabbed you in the last twenty-five years? Yes. But is it also true? You are suffering various things of tension, stress, anxiety, this, that. Is it a product of your mind or somebody else poking you from outside? It is your reaction to the existential situation outside. Instead of doing what is needed, what you see is when you see something wrong happening or when you see some suffering or something comes your way, you decide to poke yourself. This is about incapacitating yourself. Instead of seeing when there is a problem, you need empowerment, not incapacitating yourself, isn't it? I'm talking about empowering you so that your damn intelligence functions for you, not against you. The moment your intelligence is working against you, no god in the universe is going to help you and can help you. Yes, if your intelligence has turned against you, you are a finished case. So I'm saying, first let your intelligence work for you. If it works for you, there are many miraculous things that you can do for all those people who have still not eaten properly, for whom basic things have not been taken care of. An intelligence which is simply exploding into everything possible. If you are in rhythm with it, you will rise. If you are not in rhythm with it, it will crush you. It has no love, it has no compassion, it has no intention of helping you, it has no intention of harming you, it has no nothing. If you understand the forces and ride it, you have a fantastic life. If you do not understand, it'll crush you. You've seen people doing surfboarding on the waves in the ocean. It is such a magical thing, just riding the waves. But if you don't do it right, if you go into the waves, it's like being in a concrete mixer, it'll just do that and it'll kill you. So one rides the wave, another gets crushed by the wave, that is all that's happening. The rest is all human interpretations. This is the first thing we have to stop, that we do not extend our thought and emotion to the existence. This is relevant between you and me. This is relevant between you and your family members. You love them, I love you, you love me, all this fine. Don't look up at the sky and say, I love you. <laughs> it will not say, I love you back, <laughs> because it has no such need. It's pure existence. This is what you have to become. If you sit here, 
you are a complete existence by yourself. This is a full-fledged life, it does not need anything from anybody, it has everything. It is connected with everything in the universe, it does not need anything. But we want to play our games, okay, we can do all this stuff. But you need to understand right now, we are trying to extend our compulsions to the whole creation. It doesn't work like that. Existence is not trying to help you. You may be in tune with it, bingo, you are. Whether you got in tune with it consciously or unconsciously, somehow you got in tune. That's why Sankara said, yogaratova bhogaratova. That means somehow you do it, I don't care. Your Sankara, Adi Sankara went to the extent of somehow you do it. You get it, man, that's important. <laughs> How you get it, who cares? <laughs> Sadhguru, I am constantly torn between my senior colleagues who are extremely skilled surgeons. Uh, Sadhguru, the, on the heart there are some procedures which are done by very few people on this planet. I'll, I'll give an example. I do an operation called pulmonary endarterectomy. That's the, the blood clots from the leg goes to the lung arteries and it clogs up all the arteries. So 20, 25 years ago, there was no cure for this. And once you're diagnosed, you're destined to die within a year. Today, people who are on home oxygen for two years, three years, you do the operation, they can go back to skydiving or they can go to scuba diving. That's the transformative effect. But there are only 50 surgeons, less than 50 surgeons in this world who can operate. And like this, we have some of my colleagues who are extremely gifted surgeons. They are in their 50s now. And some of them are constantly talking about retirement. Especially one surgeon who is an extremely gifted surgeon who can fix any damaged valve. He is single, he has no other commitments. Every other day he talks about going to Banaras or somewhere and retire. And I keep telling him that God didn't create him to retire and meditate. He has to be fixing all these problems. <laughs> <laughs> so he gives me extension every six months, uh, Guruji. So, at the end of six months, the usual rigmarole starts, he talks about retirement and everybody is depressed in the hospital. So, how do you deal with this kind of people? You must, uh, you must give him a one-year sabbatical with me <laughs> Yes. Because uh, the, the need or the idea of retirement enters anybody's mind because of the monotony of what they're doing, whatever it may be. Somebody else may think it's a great thing, but in your experience somewhere it's becoming monotonous or stagnant. Stagnation is one thing that human intelligence and human system cannot take and most of the ailments are because of stagnation, stagnation of life. They may be… they may be getting their, uh, you know, once in three years promotion, they may be making a little more money, all these things may be happening. But somewhere experientially there is a stagnation, which could be a major cause for many of the complex ailments that people manufacture within the systems. The more complex they get, you try to create more talented surgeons, I'm saying we are manufacturing the problems, we are trying to manufacture a solution. I think as we offer solutions, people who have already gotten into problems, they need solution. But it's very important that we teach people how not to create these problems. So that instead of fifty, you have to produce five thousand expert surgeons to attend to all these people who are on self-help to illness. So I would say a surgeon who's who has a certain competence and who has worked through his life, if he wants to explore something of his own nature, that would be the greatest thing to do because he's not a man without commitment, not competence. When competence and commitment is there, 
you should not run him through the rigram role and destroy the possibility. It's important that he explores something of his own nature, which will make him… We don't know what he'll come up with. You cannot even estimate what he may come up That's with. It's our business because somehow we've landed in a place where you and me are at least eating well. Once we are in such a privilege, we must use our intelligence to see what is the best thing we can do in the world, not sit here and twist yourself out. I'm saying don't twist yourself out. If you are joyful, naturally you will do the best things you can do. If I meet you when you're very happy, will you be nice to me? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't believe that. When you're very happy, if I meet you, I'm sure you're a wonderful person. But when you're depressed, when you're unhappy, when you're frustrated, if I meet you, you could be a nasty person. This is true with every human being, isn't it? So the first and foremost work that any human being has to do, do is that you make this into your pleasant piece of life, so that you naturally exude this pleasant in ev pleasantness in every possible way. If this is feeling unpleasant and you tell this one to be pleasant, is it going to work? We are trying to fix the stomach full people right now. It was a pleasure listening to you, unbelievable. But my question is, uh, what uh, can I do to, so that I can acquire your skill of clarity? Uh, honestly, can, <laughs> honestly, candidly speaking, a, a very few people, you know, are like you are. You have, I'm sure you have heard this before. Uh, so uh, w what makes you… what makes you so secure from within and being so candid, honest, truthful? Clarity of expression. I didn't know that's a popular question <laughs> When we say clarity, that means <clears throat> I want to tell you a joke but it's it's a dirty joke, so I thought I'll skip that one <laughs> No, no, I'll… S I'll come with something milder, you know <laughs> The problem with the human being right now is this. We have created a world we have created education systems, created education systems where we believe that human beings are essentially all wrong or the creation is all wrong or the source of creation or the creator is all wrong and you going to fix it. <laughs> this is a convoluted idea. Instead of paying attention to life, we are coming up with philosophies and philosophies and philosophies. Philosophies are fantastic explanations to that which cannot be explained. If you want to know life, you must pay attention to life, isn't it? Right now, do you agree with me, madam, that this human mechanism is the most sophisticated machine on the planet? Do you agree with me? Are you a doctor? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, this is such a complex machine, this is the super, super computer, all right? I'm asking, have you bothered to read the user's manual? If you understand how this functions, you would know how to use it. Even if you take a simple gadget like a phone, the more you know about it, the better you can use it, isn't it so? You have definitely… coming from India, you've definitely been bombarded 
with this thing about realization, self-realization. Let me put it in very simple terms. What self-realization means is, first of all, what the word realization means, realization is not an achievement, it is not an accomplishment, it is just realization. That means something that's always here, you just manage to see it now. That means you were stupid all your life, <laughs> just now you saw it. You did not invent something new, you did not ramp yourself up to a mountain. No, you just saw the most obvious thing which was always here, you realized. <laughs> so, realization means you realized how foolish you have been, everything has been right here and you didn't get it. So there are many ways, of course, uh, most of you being from the Indian origin, I'm… 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 I'm not read this. I have to admit, I've never read the Gita <laughs> because it never occurred to me. I'm sorry, I know this is a shock <laughs> but uh, you know, be living in India, bits and pieces of this are always floating around in the air and it's… you know many pieces of it but I've never really studied it in any sense. So when… in a certain moment, when Arjuna asked, what is the nature of this truth that you're talking about? Where is it? So Krishna laughed and said, the highest truth about your life is the tip of your nose. Now there are many schools of yoga intensely focusing on the tips of their noses. <laughs> Please try it for two minutes, you will get a headache. You will not get enlightened. What he is saying is, it is the most obvious thing. It is the most obvious thing. But right now the problem is, all the instruments of perception that you have are outward bound, but the seat of your experience is within you. The fundamental seat of your experience is within you, but all the instruments of perception are outward bound. So how should I do this? You must understand, Anything beyond survival, if it has to enter your life, some striving is needed. Let's say, as a little infant, you were left in the jungle without human contact. If something edible came in front of you, would you first try your ears, then nostrils and somehow by accident find your mouth? Is that so? You would just know where to put it, isn't it? So what I am saying is, everything that is necessary for survival is built into you. It… you are born with it. The five senses takes care of it. But if you want to know something more, you have to strive. For example, do you remember when you were three, four or five years of age, you had to learn to write the alphabet, the damn A, how complicated it was. And they… on top of it there were two versions. You had to write it a hundred times to get it, isn't it? But today with your eyes closed you can write. If that striving was not there, today could you write? Today would you know language? So anything beyond survival needs striving. Without the needed striving it won't happen. There are ways to perceive the interiority of who you are. But unfortunately there's been no striving. Right now, we made this technology into such a simple, almost like a physical science. A plus B equals this or <clears throat> two parts of hydrogen, one part of oxygen, water will come. If a great scientist puts it together, only water will come. An idiot puts it together, only water will come. So we made the entire yoga sutras like this, that if you do this, this and this, this will happen to you. That simple and all I'm asking generally from people is about thirty… thirty to thirty-two hours of focused time to develop an instrument where they can turn inward. Oh, thirty hours is too much. I'm saying if you cannot dedicate a little bit of time to know what this is, 
that means your existence must be truly worthless. If this is worthwhile, you must pay attention to this, isn't it? If you want to know life, this is life, isn't it? When I say the word life, maybe you're thinking about your profession, your family, your car, your home. No, these are all accessories. This is life, isn't it so? Hello? <laughs> but no attention has been paid. Your idea of fixing life is fixing all kinds of things. This happened one day. Shankar and Pillai was going home. No, I'm not done. Shankar and Pillai was going home. It is 7.30 in the evening. The rules at home, the wife's rules are eight, he must be home. It's only 7.30, he thought there's still time. Let me have a quick drink and go. He just stepped into the local bar. He had a quick drink and a quick drink and a quick drink and a quick drink and a quick drink. And a quick drink. Then he looked at the time. <laughs> it's at 2 a.m. You know, drinking people are like yogis, they become timeless. <laughs> There's certain correlation. <laughs> then it's late and he got off the bar stool and tried to walk. It's such an unfair world. A man is supposed to walk on a round planet, as if that's not enough, it spins. <laughs> you notice that the planet is round and it's spinning, only when you had a few drops more <laughs> or a few drops are missing between two you, your two years. <laughs> Either you're drunk or you have a vertigo, then you notice the planet is round and spinning. <laughs> Otherwise, you think it's flat and you're going on fine. <laughs> so with great difficulty, he was walking sideways and trying to find his way home. He was crossing a garden and he flipped over and fell face down into a rose bush. His face became a mess. Then he somehow reached home and you know these keyholes are so minute, it took twenty minutes to find the keyhole. <laughs> then he found his way up to the bedroom and then he went into the bathroom and he looked at his face, it was a real mess. Then he opened the medicine cabinet, took out, I think, a sabbatical <laughs> is good. <laughs> He may come up with something that you not thought possible. <laughs> I will… I will convey your message, Jai Sadhguru. I'm sure he's watching this program <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I believe that talent is something which is grossly exaggerated in success. It's… When I was in medical school, I used to teach martial art. Uh, that was my passion. <laughs> and uh, every time a Bruce Lee's movie was released, all these school kids would come and join in hordes to martial art schools. We used to call it Bruce Lee They're phenomenon. They're gone after two weeks. <laughs> yes. And I used to see some kids whose physique is meant for martial art, who have the natural flair and I used to think, oh, this kid is going to get a black belt. And interestingly, Swamiji, mm -hmm. after six months, they're never there. The guys who go up to the black belt and, you know, do something very good in martial art are the ones who join the school without any skills, without any talent, who worked very, very hard for everything they had to sweat it out, but in the end, they are the ones who succeed. How do you explain this phenomenon? <clears throat> See, uh, for a variety of reasons, let me not go beyond this, for a variety of reasons, a certain individual could be born with a certain flair, physical flair, mental flair, emotional flair, style, you know, five-year-old child, one has style, other is clumsy, okay? <laughs> a 
So the one with the style is not going to become necessarily a fashion thing. Somebody else who seems to be clumsy may grow into something else. Like, uh, you don't know when a woman is pregnant, the child within that womb, whether it's a sage or a sorcerer, not the woman know. No, the mother does not know whether she is producing a sage or a sorcerer or what. This is because, I use the word coherence because of modern science is using that word. Who you are here right now, as you sit here, this is physics. Every subatomic particle is in constant contact with everything. What you call as cosmos is living life and it's a live mind. You have captured only one small part of it. If you work with only that one smart, small part of what you have captured, both as life and as intelligence, you will function at a certain level. If you apply yourself to break the barriers of your limitations that you've set for yourself, then there is an intelligence beyond anybody's understanding, beyond anybody's estimate which is available to you. Once this is available to you, people think you're superhuman. No, this is not about being superhuman. This is about realizing that being human is super. The immensity of being human has not been realized. So we are always making a, a kind of a mathematical calculation. Okay, if this person has this much IQ, maybe this is what he will become. This is what Newton's law, that everything that moves on this planet works to a mathematical precision or a geometric precision. That is, if you take a pendulum, the length of the pendulum will decide how it will swing. If you take a projectile, depending upon its mass, velocity and uh, the, pr the trajectory, it will go to a certain place. That is not how the cosmos is working, because what you think is physical and not physical is all mixed up within this, within this human being. The physical self, the psychological self, the emotional self and who you call as myself, the life within you, the fundamental life process, these are all different dimensions. And the innermost core of who you are, which… because all the other words are corrupted, I'll use the word life or just you, what you call as me. This, if you allow it, if you do not identify it with any form, with your physical form or with other different identities that you take on, it has a, a way of being cohesive or collaborative with everything around. When we say somebody worked hard, all he is trying to do is stretch his boundary of identity, isn't it? He's trying to stretch his boundary. If he succeeds to set, stretch his boundary, something that was… he never thought possible or imagined that is within his competence or capability becomes his. Miraculously, I can show you hundreds of people who come to me, we prepare them for a certain period and then we initiate them in twenty-four hours you will see the shape of their face will change. Genetics are altered in twenty-four hours time. You can see the photographic images, they have actually changed dramatically overnight simply because of a certain extension of their identity. So, in the Indian spiritual milieu, see when you say spiritual, we must understand this. This is not about looking up or looking down. When we say spiritual, we are talking about transcending the limitations of physical. So right now, the physical is here as if it's a solid entity in people's experience. But modern physics is telling you and medical science is beginning to telling, tell you, or if people don't understand, if they just hold their nose for two minutes, they understand that they are not an independent existence. It is in transaction, not just in terms of breath. Even on the level of subatomic particles, it's in constant transaction. If this transaction becomes even minutely conscious, suddenly you have immense capabilities that you never thought were possible. Biological identity is the most limiting identity that you have because it limits to the area of your body. Now when you strive, you break this. It doesn't matter in what way you strive. Most people strive in unconscious, unscientific, simply out of striving, they do things. But there are ways to strive scientifically in a proper way. There are tools to strive with specific direction to break the 
limitations of who we are. If you break this boundary, the subatomic particles are transacting, the intelligence is transacting, only you're missing the whole game. If you don't miss the game, if you are in the game of life, not in the game of thoughts and emotions, you are in the game of life, suddenly just about anything you want, you can do, not this or that. I'm saying anything can a human being can do, simply if he breaks his barriers. And these barriers are many levels, but the most fundamental thing is the identity <laughs> But otherwise in every cell in the body there is air. So when you say air, it's not just the breath, Six percent air is in every cell in the body. Just remove it a little bit from the brain, it'll be good. It's good if it's in the lungs, in the heart, in the muscles. They function better if there is oxygen, you know? Do you know this? If you're oxygen deprived, muscles become rigid because this needs air, otherwise it'll not work. So. Water is seventy-two percent. <laughs> so maximum care should be taken about the water because it's seventy-two percent. If you are going to an examination, suppose uh, it is like this, let's say you're going for physics examination. You have water, earth, this, that. But just the water subject is for seventy-two marks. Naturally you spend more time reading about water, isn't it? Studying water, yes or no? Air is only six percent. You may not study because you are okay with ninety-four. Water you must study because it's seventy-two percent. You must take enormous care about the water because it's seventy-two percent and it has tremendous memory. If I open this water, even without opening, if I say something to this water, it remembers. There has been lot of experiments in this direction. So, uh, if you take this water from wherever the water works is and pump it to your house, let's say it went through fifty bends, forced pumped forcefully with a certain force, which naturally is done, and you are living on twelfth floor of the apartment, so further forced up. Now they are saying, if it goes through fifty bends, about sixty percent of the water has turned poisonous. Immediately when it comes in the tap, if you take it and immediately drink it, it will work as poison in your system. If you take it and hold it for some time, it will undo itself again. Because the poisoning is not chemical, it is molecular. Molecular changes are happening, no chemical changes happening. This is why traditionally your grandmother always told you, always you must gather the water, keep it overnight in your house, in a properly cleaned vessel with vibhuti and kunkum on it and one flower on it. Yes or no? Traditional homes? Only tomorrow morning you drink it, not as soon as it comes inside your house, you don't drink it because it carries all kinds of memories. In very traditional homes, people every day do puja to the water pot, yes? And you never drink the water as soon as it comes, you keep it, give it enough time to undo itself from whatever nonsense it has gathered, so that it is suitable for you when you drink it. Water you must take care because it's seventy-two percent. It's more, it's first class, you know, more than passing mark. Next thing is food because that's the earth, twelve percent, still substantial, isn't it? So how food goes into you, from whose hands it comes to you, how you eat it, how you approach it, all these things are important. Then comes your air, six percent. In that six percent, only one percent or less is your breath. Rest is happening in so many other ways. And it's important, especially if you have children, at least once a month, 
take them out somewhere, not to the damn cinema, again breathing everybody's nonsense. <laughs> the air gets affected just by the sounds and the intentions and the emotions, all the rubbish that's happening on the screen and all the rubbish that's reflecting in human minds of violence, of sex, of greed, of this and that, is affecting that limited air in that hall in a tremendous way. So instead of taking them to the cinema, take them to the river, teach them how to swim, climb a mountain, where is mountain Sadhguru? Himalayas is so far away. <laughs> Even a small hill is a mountain for your boy. Yes? Even a little rock, just go climb and sit on one of them. Children will enjoy it immensely, they will become fit, you will become fit. And above all, your body and mind will function differently. And above all, you are in touch with the creator's creation, which is the most important thing. Not your own rubbish that you made. Yes, it's comfortable right now, but it's not everything. So instead of going to the restaurant, instead of going to the cinema, instead of going somewhere else like that, at least once a month, it doesn't cost anything. Huh? Doesn't cost anything. You can take your rice and aukai and go and eat there. <laughs> anyway, you have it. You don't have to spend money on this. Even better, if you don't want to spend money even on the bus or car, all of you cycle, just three kilometers, five kilometers outside Hyderabad, sit on one rock, just spend time there, feel the sun. It's very important, you get some sun, air, good water. Come back, you are doing Bhuta Shuddhi in a very natural way. It is not the ultimate type of Bhuta Shuddhi, but you are doing some Bhuta Shuddhi. This is what I was saying just now, if you take care of food, water, air is not always in your hands because you're living in a city. But water and food you can take care. And what kind of fire burns within you, that also you can take care. Sunlight has not become impure, isn't it? Get some sunlight every day, please. Get some sun on your body every day because sunlight is still pure, isn't it? Nobody can fortunately contaminate it. And what kind of fire burns within you? Is it the fire of greed, fire of hatred, fire of resentment, fire of anger, fire of love, fire of compassion? What kind of fire burns within you? You take care of that, then you don't worry about your physical and mental well-being, it's taken care of. I've spoken in the prisons, I've spoken in many places <laughs> So you're here willingly, you're doing something willingly is the fundamental of your joy, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. However simple or stupid or idiotic activity it is, I am doing something willingly makes a world of difference, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. The difference between heaven and hell is just this. You're doing something willingly, that's your heaven. You're doing something unwillingly, that's your hell. Hmm? We have already taken on attitudes, what we like and what we don't like. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now with this person I will do things willingly, with this person I'll do things un unwillingly. This may be two people, two aspects of life, two communities, two nations, two many things. This I will do willingly, this I do unwillingly. This means I've decided in my mind this is good, this is bad. When I hear even on national news channels, good guys and bad guys, it just… Once you have this kind of thing, you are going to be disastrous to the planet. It's just a question of time. The moment you decide this is a good person, this is a bad person, this has gone deep into American society, no. There are no good people and bad people. Everybody is oscillating between the two. If you create a very pleasant, wonderful atmosphere, everybody behaves wonderfully. If you create an unpleasant atmosphere, a whole lot of people act nasty. Yes or no? 
there are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. The… the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. Mm. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I'm like this. Because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy. These privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too. Because if somebody else can decide, what can happen within you right now? Isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, sim so many people decide. Hmm? What happens around us is not hundred percent ours. But what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers. They're unwilling. Mm -hmm. Volunteering means you have no will of your own. You can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization. This means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing. <laughs> and I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> So people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she is so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven. <laughs> and today, Today. But if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes. yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. All kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you will find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I, I, I always say that it's the resistance. <laughs> life. Many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere after 3 a.m. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, it will bear maximum fruit.
in the way the planet is spinning and what is happening, something very fundamental changes somewhere between 320 to 340. This is called Brahma Mahurtam. This is relevant only up to 33 degrees latitude. Your system, human system, functions in a certain way. It is a possibility. So, uh, there has been an awareness about making use of this possibility. Your life is a product of many things that we call as the universe, many things that we call as existence. So we are a consequence of a certain phenomenal happening that we call as cosmos. We are not an individual existence. So when you get in sync, certain things will happen. You know, there's a <coughs> cicadius in uh, where we are in Tennessee, the U.S. ashram, they wake up once in seventeen years. Can you beat it? They know it is seventeen years and they come awake and they breathe and they go back to sleep. They're keeping time once in seventeen years, no alarm bell anywhere. Well, how is this? I'm saying they're in sync with nature. We have lost sync within nature and we think that is our nature. No, all the many ailments, many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces which are making us who we are. So yoga is to bring that sync so that you are in rhythm with life. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere just after three a.m. If you're conscious, suddenly a certain spark of aliveness will happen within you. Even if you're in deep sleep, you will come awake. This must happen to you. This means you're falling in sync with it. You're falling in sync with life. So what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do a Kriya? Doesn't matter what, you must do a process for which you have been initiated for, because initiation means… Just do this one simple exercise. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy. Generally, in India they told you, you should not put your head to the north and sleep. Hmm? Hmm? You're aware of this? If you put your head to the north and sleep during the night when you… when you're in horizontal positions, then slowly the blood will get pulled towards your brain. When there's too much circulation in the brain, you cannot sleep peacefully. If you have any kind of you know, inherently weak aspects in your brain or if you're of old age, you could die in your sleep. One can have hemorrhage because extra blood is trying to enter the brain where the blood vessels are hair-like. Something extra is being pushed because of the magnetic pull. When you're in a vertical position, this is not so. The moment you become horizontal, this pull on the head is so strong that slowly the blood tries to move towards the brain. So to avoid this, this is true only in the Northern Hemisphere. If you go to Australia, you should not put your head to the south. If you're in India, you should not put your head to the north. You can put it any other way, it's okay. You were not just thought a practice, it was introduced into your system. It was implanted in your system. So whatever, if there is a live seed within you, if you're awake at Brahma Mahartam and sit for whatever that practice is, it bears maximum fruit because 
of the way the planet is behaving in relation to your system. If you become aware in a certain way, a certain level of awareness is achieved within you, you will see, you will simply know when that time is. If you go to bed at the right time, you don't have to look at your watch. You will always know when it is 3.40 because the body will behave in a different way. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, not what you picked up from a book, it will bear maximum fruit. The seed will get the necessary support at that time for it to sprout or spurt up more rapidly than, you, uh, than at other times. This is only for the initiated. If you are not initiated, you are a book yogi, then 3.40, 6.40, 7.40, not so much of a difference. Sandhya colors are more important for such people. Sandhya means twenty minutes before sunrise, twenty minutes after sunrise or twenty minutes before sunset and twenty minutes after sunset. The same goes for noon and midnight but they are of a different nature. So these two twilights are better for the uninitiated. 3.40 is good for those who have been powerfully initiated. You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed. It's very, very important because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you're incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals, you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower, always to shower before go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night, go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep. It doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, 
it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin. A whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens which is beyond cleaning the skin. Keep this in your mind that you are truly a mortal, okay? Not in words, really, you could fall dead right now. Uh, you may be young, you may be old, it doesn't matter, you can fall dead right now. Yes or no? Before you go to bed, sit on your bed and think this is your deathbed. You have just one more minute to live. Just look back and see, what you have done today, is it worthwhile? Just do this one simple exercise and you don't know when it really happens, whether you'll be sitting on your deathbed or lying in a hospital, all kinds of things sticking into you, who knows how it'll happen. But enjoy this every day that you'll sit on your deathbed, look back and see today, the way I've handled these twenty-four hours, is it worthwhile? Because now I'm dying. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. So every day in the night, all of you should do this before you go to bed. Last three minutes, everything that you have gathered, the body, the content of the mind, things, don't ignore small things, the small things are big things. I've seen how people are carrying their, their own private pillow, you know? <laughs> because it's very important. <laughs> So, your pillow, your footwear, if you have relationships, everything that you have gathered, keep it aside, sleep. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy, with much more possibilities than you have imagined possible. Just sleep as life, not as a man, not as a woman, not as this and that. Keep everything down, simply. See, I'm, this is getting too easy. Just sleeping sadhana, hmm? At least this you must do. I'm talking about attention, not even about something, just being attentive in the yogic systems. We have what is called as dashavadanis, shatavadanis. What this means is, a man will do ten things at the same time. Now, when you don't miss a thing, everybody thinks you're some kind of a superhuman being. We can give you very uh, dynamic processes through which you can scale up your attention to a higher and higher level. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision, and vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you're saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. 
So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. <laughs> I like music. <laughs> so, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organization, to be a volunteer. A volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, thank you. <laughs> because I've sp spoken to conscripted people also. Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference. There is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I am talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. He knows his strength is gone on the football field because there are younger boys who are running, so you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. It is just that, who is able to extract the best out of the given situation? Namaskaram Sadhguru, you are a football fan. In your view, who is better between Messi and Ronaldo? See, this is the whole thing. On a given day, maybe I can play better than Messi. But that doesn't make me better than him because he's got… he's climbed through the steps, all right? One ball, if he kicks into the goal, it may go above the goal. If I kick, it may go in. So I'll say, I'm better than Messi. It doesn't work like that. So it's not who is better than whom, it is just that who is able to extract the best out of the given situation. Well, because you're talking about an international game, Messi has had the fortune, I would say to win that game. Because as everybody could see, he's lost his pace, still got fantastic skills, but he doesn't have speed, he's not able to run with the young boys, not able to retain the ball, but he's very good. So he realizes that he's not a fool to try to outrun those young boys and kill himself. He's just giving the necessary passes and making the difference. That's a smart man, isn't it? Very smart man. He's not thinking I should score. He's just making sure the ball is in the right place so that somebody scores. So he's using his skills. He knows his strength is gone on the football field because there are younger boys 
who are running, you know, always two, three steps ahead of him. So, this whole thing about... Now what you're asking is, is a jasmine flower better or a rose flower better? So you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. If you see both of them in variety of club games that they've played, which is where their skills were largely exhibited, in international games they're little out of place because it's not their regular teammates. Uh, international games are little rougher, not by the rule, because national emotions are there. These fine players cannot play very well there. Ruffians play better <laughs> Very fine players cannot play very well in international games. In the club games, everybody is a professional. They play a certain level of game, there they will excel. So both of them have excelled beautifully in their clubs. Well, sometimes when you made a wrong choice of entering a wrong club and stuff, even if you're a great player, say Ronaldo sits on the bench in Manchester, Manchester United, because issues, other issues other than football will come up. Ronaldo did his best, but towards the end, he could not do his best because he couldn't handle the situations and the realities of life at the age of thirty-seven, what he should be. I think Messi handled that situation of his age gracefully and I think it paid off for him. And it's not all in his hands, the team and the situations, the opposition teams, many, many things are there. So if you want to see in the finals, is Bappe better or Messi better? Bappe is way better, he's playing like Pillay, all right? But things didn't work. Things didn't work, he's only twenty-three. He's moving faster than almost anybody in the entire tournament, but couldn't win. In the end, that's all that matters. This is what you need to understand. What we are doing in our lives is not all ours. Many things are there. It's happened to you many times, you hit the tree but it went on the green. Oh, that's how you win <laughs> It happens. You eat, you think you hit a great shot, but it bounced somewhere else. You hit a bad shot, but it came back where it should be. Well, all these factors are there. So don't go looking for luck hitting the trees. No, you do your best. What happens is not all yours. That goes for even the best champions of champions, all right? No question. So it's not right at any time that you don't pose this question even to yourself, am I better than the guy who's sitting next to you? Don't do this. What is the best I can do? That's all. 